Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Tennis Files podcast. It's another very special one as it is a live broadcast. So we're, we're broadcasting live right now on YouTube and also on Facebook. And I want to welcome Brent Abel from uh, Web Tennis. Brent, how's your day going? Oh, Mayor Bond, uh, fantastic. Like we said before we started the broadcast, uh, here in St. Bell Springs, Colorado, I mean, there's just not a bad day out here. You wake up here in the mornings and go, man, just don't screw this up. This is way too good. So <laughs> all good here. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. Yeah, things are good here. Fortunately, I know it's pretty crazy around the country. And um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, how has tennis been overall um, in your area as far as like been people been able to play restrictions and so forth? Yeah, yeah. So back when the restrictions started back in March, uh, ironically, my wife, mine, and I had just won the, the National Husband Wife Grass Courts at Mission Hills down in the desert. That was on March 14th. And I think the very next day, uh, everything kind of got shut down. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went there in the desert, March, April for you know, a few weeks where there was no tennis, but it was a great opportunity to get out, ride the bike, get some exercise. Um, and then they let us back eventually had to wear a mask for about a week and then they just stopped doing that. So, and then here in steamboat, it's been, you know, you got to wear a mask if you go inside the clubhouse or inside the indoor courts to kind of check in. But other than that, um, but I, I, you know, I, I just got actually a text on my phone this morning from the state of Colorado saying mandatory masks. So, I don't know what that means. It may be when I show up at the Steamboat Tennis Center this morning that, uh, well, I, I better be taking my mask. So so we'll see. Yeah, Brent, I think you should. Uh, we actually, I'm not going to divulge any names, but there was an incident recently within our, our leagues. I mean, I'm, I'm the chair of the the uh, Montgomery County Tennis Leagues, and there was someone who, I guess, caused a ruckus. And yeah, it's just, you know, it's weird times. But uh, I'm really happy to have you on, Brent, to talk about Winning gold balls, um, uh, you know, you have like a great, I believe it's a podcast actually uh, with the same name, obviously, that's about winning gold balls. And so everybody should check that out. What, what's the full name of that again? It's goldballhunting.com. Uh, yeah. And it's a, it's, um, it's a podcast that uh, my good friend, great tennis player, great coach, Jeff Jacklich, he and I uh, uh, actually did 365 episodes in a row just to try to see if we can make it through a year. We actually did it. But um, yeah, that was kind of the, that was sort of the, you know, how do you take the guys who are consistently in the national category, uh, won tournaments, you know, the gold ball events, who are getting through a round or two, you know, how do we help help them get to the quarterfinals, something like that, so they actually have a chance to get in the semis and get to the, you know, get to the ball round, whether it's, you know, a gold, a silver, or a, a bronze, but, um, but that's the focus behind that. We haven't actually done a, an episode since I think J January of this year, but there's obviously 365 podcasts there. You can go, you know, <laughs> you can go check them out. Hopefully that's enough for all of you. Yeah. Uh, it is for me. It is for me, but, uh, really curious about the whole process of winning gold balls, because I know for a lot of us, of course, you know, we can't, uh, be on the, the pro tour winning Wimbledon and so forth, but you know, there's this other avenue of winning, uh, a championship like this, that is going to be so valuable and memorable for so many people. So uh, I'm going to start with kind of like a broader question for you, which is how hard is it to win a gold ball? Wow. How hard is it? To, well, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of those things where you've got, I mean, if that's your goal, if you want to really kind of dive into the competitive thing and in terms of senior tennis and look, age group tennis now, I mean, it used to be just, you know, the 35s, I think it now starts in the 25s and it's every five year increment you get, you know, you get a new age group, but, um, it kind of depends. I mean, for me, it was hard because I was not a very good junior player. I played a lot of baseball as a kid growing up in Berkeley, California. And even though I was born uh, or when I was born, I was uh, my mom and dad were members of the Berkeley Tennis Club. So I grew up like about a seven minute walk from the Berkeley Tennis Club. But I just did not play a ton of, of junior tennis. And I played a lot of baseball. I think I played one summer when I was in the 14s, tried to play some junior tournaments got beat by Eric Van Dillon, I think three times in a row, lost 0-0 every one of them. And I just said, you know, 
screw it. This tennis thing's no fun. So I went back to playing baseball and, and then really never got going until I was probably in my mid twenties in terms of trying to really get out and, you know, take advantage of the Berkeley tennis club and start playing some. So it took me a while because, you know, so, you know, if you grew up as a junior player and if you grew up as a, you know, a great junior or a great college player and maybe even dabble in the pro tour a little bit and after college is, you know, you've got this foundation that, that, that I just never had. And so uh, I did with my first gold ball in the 35s, my second year in the 35s. And it was kind of, it was kind of a fluke. It was the national 35 hardcourt doubles and it was a full draw 64. There weren't any buys. We weren't seated. My partner and I, Rob Olson and I were not seated. And yet it was just one of those weeks where, you know, we just couldn't do anything wrong. And, and we ended up, you know, sort of taking it match by match. And finally, got to the finals and went, well, we got nothing to lose here and maybe played the best tennis I've ever played, you know, at that, at that thing. So, um, so that was kind of fluky, but I didn't win another gold ball until 25 years later, wow. which was the national 60 um, uh, hardcourt singles. And so, you know, 25 years between gold balls is, you know, maybe a record. I don't know. Um, but it just, it's hard. I mean, it's, it's, it takes, um, it takes number one, you got to be able to show up um, at tournaments at these category one uh, ball tournaments on a regular basis. I mean, you just can't cherry pick. Well, I'm going to go play this tournament this year, the one tournament because I'm best on clay or I'm best on grass or I'm best on a hard court and just kind of, you just can't do that. I mean, the way you learn is, is you got to go get beat up over and over and over again. And rather than thinking, well, I'm going to train and I'm going to work and I'm going to point towards this one tournament because next year is my first year in that new age group. And everyone thinks that, well, my first year in a new age group, I'm the young guy. And yet it's the same players. I mean, the same players keep moving up with you anyway. So it's, it's, it's a minor advantage when you're, you know, the first year or two in a new age group, but other than that, it's not, it's not really much of an advantage. Um, but I, I think for, I think for me, it's, it's been a long haul of trying to figure out how do I become super efficient with stroke technique so that I can eliminate unforced uh, idiot kind of errors as much as possible and um, and really starting to think more strategically about shot choice and court position rather than, hey, if I really work on my cross court forehand, well, that's going to be the, the thing that's maybe going to help me win a goal ball. That before I've sat there and worked for, you know, years, 25 years between goal balls, thinking that's what I had to do. And it wasn't really it that that really wasn't the payoff. So. Yeah, it's hard, but but it's doable. And and you, you you know, it's kind of one of those things where you have to have some great coaching. You just have to have some great coaching. It's one of those things where you can figure it out on your own, but you do need to be able to show up at those events. You do need to be able to go to each one of the top players, not only ask them, you know, questions, whatever it is. Not only, you know, beg, hey, can we go out and hit a few balls? I'll be happy to warm you up in your match. Yeah, I know you're playing tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I've been out of the tournament for two days, but um, I'm happy to get out there whatever time you want. And the guy goes, fine, I'll see you at 7 o'clock. And so you go out there and you hit for maybe 30 minutes and, you know, you you glean a little nugget. And, and, then, and then you go watch these guys play. You watch the top guys play. And I think one of the big mistakes that I see is – Players thinking, well, if I watch Federer, if I watch Rafa, if I watch Novak, I watch how these guys stroke technique, whatever. Uh, it just doesn't translate to senior tennis. It doesn't translate to winning a go to winning a gold ball. So there's a lot to it in terms of. I think you got to have some good coaching. I think you got to show up at every every tournament you can, which means that if you're working full time and you're raising a family. And for me, I mean, I took probably 10, 12 years off between the 40s and and kind of the 50s in terms of, you know, raising a family and working and just didn't have the time. 
uh, to be able to put into all of the off-court training, all the on-court training, and all the travel, and and all that, and and just learning, learning what what it takes to be able to start winning, not only the first round but the second round, the third round, finding your name up there in the quarterfinals. You know, in the last eight guys of 128 draw, and and just going, man. I mean. So all that stuff takes time. It takes work. And it kind of takes that mindset of just going, you know what? I'm just not going to, I'm not going to ever stop. I'm never, ever going to quit. I don't, I don't care how many bad losses I have. I'm just going to keep showing up and I'm going to keep working. And I don't think there's, I don't think there's a formula for it. Right. Mary Bond, I can't tell you like, well, here's the gold ball winning formula. Come you on. know, I can tell you what I did. Yeah, and sure. and you know some of what I did is duplicatable, but a lot of it's not. I mean, a lot of it's not. And um, so, for a long-winded non-answer, there it is. Good answer. <laughs> a lot of things to take from that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, first off, it's so wonderful to to hear that even yourself, who essentially didn't. Um, you know, start competing very seriously until like later on uh, in your life that you still have amassed, you know, these great titles and experiences. And uh, really curious too about, you know, you mentioned that uh, it's very important for us to to talk to people who are where we want to be. And that's so, so important and smart. You know, it's it's we shouldn't shoot for or try to emulate Federer if we're in our 50s, 60s and beyond and trying to win a gold ball. It's just a different game. So on that note, um, what types of things have you changed in your game uh, as you've you know progressed in your wisdom and sageness uh, to yeah, in your game to that you can maybe impart some wisdom upon us to, to help us? Yeah, I, I would say it's kind of a mental, it's a, it's it's a mindset shift moving from I've got to win the point on my own, meaning I've either got to hit a winner or I've got to hit such a great shot that it's really kind of a forced error by my opponent over there, as opposed to learning a lot, lot more about core position and learning about, well, if if I'm if if I can constantly put myself in the right place on the court in relation to where the ball is over there in relation to where my opponent is. I guess what I, what, what, what I finally learned over the years is watching the top players going, these guys aren't hitting that many outright winners. And in fact, what they're doing is they're always seem to be in the right place at the right time in terms of forcing their opponent to have to thread the needle. you right. So it could be that you play an approach shot and it used to be for me, the, the mindset was, well, the approach shot should be, the ball's not coming back. And too often I was putting pressure on myself where I would try to hit that kind of an approach shot, now right winner, and just miss it, just flat out miss it. I would never, ever give myself a chance to allow that guy over there to participate in me winning the point. So I think the, I, I think the big uh, mental shift for me has been, is really what Jeff Jacklich and I talked about on, on Gold Ball Hunting for you know, those 365 episodes was let this guy participate. It's okay if he hits the tennis ball over there. Whether it's singles, whether it's doubles, just because they're about to hit the tennis ball does not necessarily mean that they've got the advantage. And I think what's happened to my game over the last 10 years, I can't, I can't prove it because I don't have the data. But if I'd been charting my matches, I think my winners to, to um, winning points ratio had really – had really gone down, meaning I was hitting a lot less winners and, and just either they weren't putting the ball back in play or I was getting such an easy, just, you know, no brainer volley. And I don't, I don't even call that a winner. I mean, if, if, if I'm up there at net, the guy just floats one up and he's off the court. All I've got to do is just tap it in. There's no stroke. There's a, there's no stroke technique required. There's nothing fancy. I don't even look at that as a winner. So um, I think it's gone from thinking I want to take control of the point in such a way that balls don't come back to me because I'm a little fearful that if balls come back to me, that that's not a good thing. I don't trust the rest of my game to be able to, hey, if I need to stay in the point for seven, eight shots, 
can I do that? And, and, you know, I used to be a pure serve and volley guy, right? First, second serve, second serve. I mean, first, first serve, second serve, return to serve, second serve. I'd always chip and charge and come in. And lots of times, depending on the first serve, I was always trying to get in. And if I got caught back in the baseline when I was returning serve, it was like almost any ball, Maribon, to me, looked like this is an approach shot opportunity. I don't want to be back here, right? Because I wanted to end the point as soon as I possibly could. And when I was younger and I had the legs and I could do that, it worked out okay, but it didn't work out as well as it has in the last 10 years for me, which is, which is look, if you've got to stay in the point for a little bit, if you got to hit a ground stroke or two, that's okay. But allow the other guy over there to touch the ball, you know, unless you get the big, fat, chubby, wide open sitter, then fine. Then you can go ahead and, and kind of go for it. But I think it's that mindset of, of, of just thinking, um, it's okay to allow that guy to participate in me winning points and me winning games, sets and matches. And I can't tell you how many matches in the last maybe five years. Um, I've done nothing more than just say, well, here's, I mean, not that I'm a pusher because I am trying to get up. I am trying to force play. I am trying to make the guy thread the needle. All right. I'll give you two feet to my right. I'll give you two feet to my left. If you want to hit the perfect top spin lob over me, fine, go for it. But it's been a lot more about, I think players watch me play and they go, what's the big deal? <laughs> you know, this guy's not doing anything fantastic, but he's winning matches, right? Doesn't have a big weapon. Um, and I would say my only weapon now has just been court position. It's just continually placing myself with the right. And that doesn't mean it's got to be up at net. <clears throat> you could also be back in the baseline as two. You play a shot and the guy looks up to play his shot and sees that you're once again right sort of bisecting. You're right in the middle of their two, two, two extreme angles. And sometimes that puts some mental pressure on them going, God dang it. First of all, this guy's not missing. Second of all, he's always in the right place at the right time when I'm about to play my shot. Maybe I need to go for a little bit more. And, and that's really, that's what I want them thinking. I want them thinking, you know what? I got that little, I got to do a little bit more because if I don't, I'm not going to win the point. So I think it's that, I think it's that mindset shift over the years of, of watching the top guys and going, God dang it. I don't see them with a big weapon. I don't see them out there just blowing the by ball, you know, the, uh, the ball by guys. I just, I just don't see that. And yet when you're on the court with them, you feel this, this pressure. You kind of feel like, God, I can't breathe, man. It's like, it's like they're, they're constantly putting me under pressure, not with huge shots, but always making me move to a part of the court that maybe I don't want to be in. And, you know, I, I would say the biggest shot in the game now that I'm in the 70s, I would say for the last seven years, starting the 65s, the drop shot is like such a weapon. It's crazy. It's such a weapon. And, you know, I've never had to really thought about a drop shot when I was younger. And, and so, you know, and, and I, you know, if I was to do one thing to go back, man, I would stop trying to think I had to move the guys from side to side and go much more into, I need to work them up vertically, right? I need to drop them and lob over their backhand. I need them because it's much tougher, that kind of movement. I don't care what age you're at. Um, than actually just trying to, you know, trying to work them side to side. So there's something else right there, the dropper. And very few, very, very few players actually work on it, right? They don't really... They might, they might hit a couple in practice, but you know, it drives me nuts now, Mirabon. I see these these videos on YouTube and 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 you know on Facebook and these young juniors or even the young adults, whatever it is. And if I was like, if I was dropped down from Mars today and I looked at this thing, but someone said, Well, here's tennis, and I would think, well, gosh, tennis is just a toss pin forehand game. There's nothing else. I mean, so um I guess to go back to your original question, you know, what does it take? You know, you got to have a complete game. You cannot rely on just, can I get a little bit more, a few more RPMs on my topspin forehand? Because that will be the thing that's going to make me win a gold ball. No. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, great points again. And, you know, along with that, with being able to stay in the point and having that mindset, I, I know that you're going to need, 
a great level of fitness and, you know, it looks like you're a fit guy, Brent. And so, um, I was wondering, uh, you know, how much, how much does it take? And, and also, well, I mean, what types of fitness training are you doing in order to be able to last those, you know, eight or 10 plus shots, uh, in these points? Well, there's no question that you know, if you're going to challenge for a gold ball, um, if you're in a, let's say, you know, a round of 64, right? The tournament might have uh, a round of 64 that you got to play in. And that's six matches. If you're going to get to the finals, you got to, you got, <laughs> got to win six matches. Um, you know, I've been rounds of 128. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's an entire week, day after day after day. So you can't tell me that fitness is not crucial to being able to at least get, because look, I mean, what's to say that your draw is such that in the second round, you got to play a guy that should have been seated, but wasn't seated. And now all of a sudden you've just won this match in three hours and you got to come back the next morning at eight 30 to play the third round. And so it's way more than just, can you survive the eight shots in one point? It's, can you survive day after day after day? And if you're playing singles and doubles, it's, it's, um, you know, it's really kind of a survival of the fittest. Um, I mean, I, you know, the beginning before I really embraced fitness, I was actually doing okay in some of these category ones. I could get to the quarters, I could get to the semis, but by the time I got there, I was just beat up. I had nothing left in the tank. And so, um, I just started working on my fitness in terms of core positioning. What do I need to do to be quicker? Right. What do I because, you know, I tried long distance running before thinking, well, that'll build up my legs. And yeah, yeah, I did. I got super strong. My legs, I could last all day long, but I couldn't move worth a lick. I mean, I was so slow. So it's really finding that combination of what can you do off the court uh, in terms of building, building up quickness, building up speed and building up endurance, you know, without without doing so much that when you show up for the tournament, you're just you're just totally dead. So for me, it's been since I wasn't a great junior player, I wasn't a great adult player, uh, college player. um, Like I said in the beginning, I had to figure out, well, what can I do efficiently here stroke technique wise? So I'm not beating myself up. That's another reason why I just I don't I don't agree with this whole thing about, well, we got to go full Western. We got to get windshield wiper in the forehand. We got to do all these things. So we look like Rafa on the court, because to me, if you're going to compete for a gold ball and if you're going to have to do it over five or six days, why wouldn't you want to be stroke technique wise as efficient as possible on day one, day two, because the more technique you have to bring, the more effort you have to bring into your game just to be able to play is taking away. If you win today, it's taking away from some of the fuel from from tomorrow's match. So to me, it's really about, you know, fitness is about, is, is about stroke technique. Efficiency is about, is about getting off the court as fast as you can in the early rounds. So you're not, you're not beat up early. And, and is that combination of fitness, which is about quickness and endurance. And, and, you know, f- for me, tennis is, is, is a difficult game because, we have to visually track a moving tennis ball and we have to do that while we're also on the move. So like, you know, golfers, yeah, okay. I know it's a tough game, but the ball's sitting there and the golfer gets to actually come up and kind of position themselves wherever they want. So they put themselves into the ideal swing setup position, the ideal contact position. We don't have that luxury. Baseball hitters, right. Baseball, you're standing there, but, you know, you got to deal with a moving ball that's kind of coming in and they're trying to make the ball move in different ways. And, and so, but, but baseball doesn't have that thing where you have to move too. So for me, the training is like, one of the things I love to do is I love to do a lot of sprints, right? So I do a lot of sprints from, and I, I, I'd like to do it off of the hard court. So I either want to do it on a grass court, which I've got at Mission Hills Country Club down the desert or else uh, on a clay court. Or if I can't do it there, I'll, I'll find some area that's got a soft surface. But so tennis courts are what, 120 by 60, right? So from fence to fence is 120 feet. So I like to start at one fence, obviously go to the side of the net, 
because I'm going to run the entire distance, 120 feet. But what I do is I find a stationary spot or I find a, I find a spot on that far fence I'm running to. And my whole goal is that when I'm sprinting towards that fence, visually locked on that spot, I'm trying to keep my head and body so smooth as I'm sprinting. Mm. So that thing is not jumping up and down mm. over there. And the more I can train myself to do that, the better it is when I get out in the court in terms of being able to visually track a moving tennis ball as I'm also on the move. And really what that all adds up to is, is being a lot more consistent as a shot maker because you are arriving spatially to the path of that incoming ball consistently much more where you want to be um, as, you know, as opposed to not where maybe the tennis ball is kind of lurching through its, its flight as it comes to you. So, um, and you got to be able to do that over three sets. You got to be able to do that over six days, seven days. And so not only is, is, is you got to figure out what is the best training for you Mm -hmm. because your body types different than mine and so on and so forth. Right. The other thing for me has been nutrition. And I've just, I've finally <laughs> over the years figured out, hmm, let's see. Um, and, and so I think it's about two and a half years ago, my wife, mine, and I changed our diets. Um, and not that I preach any kind of diet at all, but I was having some digestive issues uh, with, with red meat. And I finally just said, look, let's just, let's try it for 30 days without it. We got off it. And I initially lost about I don't know, seven or eight pounds. And at the time I was in what I thought was really great shape, but I just dropped seven or eight pounds of apparently unneeded, you know, body weight. And so, and I kind of feel the same thing works as we get like every five years. Um, I just kind of think, well, maybe I should drop a pound or two as I get older, just because, just because our skeletal systems probably get stressed a little bit more with all the tennis, all the training, um, I can't prove it. I don't know. But um, but there's there's no question that fitness and nutrition are a major component to being able to compete for a, a gold ball. No question. 100%. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I mean, it's, I feel like even, uh, you know, some some juniors or, or adult players who are even more skilled than the players in those higher age groups, uh, a lot of them might not be fit enough to survive. Um, the entire tournament there, but um, we got some great questions that I'm uh, scanning down here. One was about rackets, and I'm going to put it up on the screen now. And Greg asks, "How about comments on choice of rackets for senior players, particularly players in the 60, 60s and up?" So, any thoughts on rackets? Well, this is coming from the great Greg Hepner from uh, I know Greg, good guy, heck of a tennis player, and you talk about stroke technique efficiency. This guy's off the charts in terms of clean strokes. Um, Look, I started playing with an oversized racket back in the 35s. So I started playing with a 110, which back then was like the biggest thing in the world, right? People saying, well, isn't that illegal, a 110? Well, and the reason I did is because I just felt like, look, um, the the bigger the racket head, assuming I could control it, Right. Assuming that I could control it um, uh, would simply mean I had a little bit bigger sweet spot, but I get a little more power, a little more spin without having to bring as much stroke technique into the into the swing. And I think a lot of players feel that, well, if I get too big of a racket, I, I lose control. And and that's true because you get a little bit more of a trampoline effect off that. But there's different ways to string the rackets, different tensions, obviously. And look, if you're playing a ton of doubles, I mean, it just makes sense that you're up at the net so often in doubles that a little bit bigger racket head just makes it just makes it easier. In terms of reflex volleys, I mean, you just can't argue with it. So um, <clears throat> over the years, um, I've gotten uh, I've stayed with a 110, and, and I finally got in the Babolat, the the uh, the original Pure Drives, and I would say about four years ago. I started running out of them because they hadn't made them for about seven or eight years. And I was trying to find them on eBay and I was, you know, begging people to sell me some beat up old, you know, Babolat 110 pure drive. Um, anyway, so 
someone had given me a weed, a weed 125, the weed 125 EX, I don't know, about a year or so before, sitting in my garage. And so I was about to go play the National 65 indoors in, Min in Minneapolis about a week in about a week. <clears throat> and so I just took this racket out, hit some balls with the guy. It felt great. I said, all right. So I called up the called up Dennis at Weed. I said, look, can you overnight me another racket? So I've got two to go to Minneapolis with. And he said, fine. So I got two rackets. I went up there and I said, well, I got the perfect excuse if I don't play well. Because I left my old rackets at home, brought, brought the two weeds with me. And I just said, like, you know, if I don't play well, okay, it's because of the racket, blah, blah, blah. Well, and I ended up having a great tournament. And I just haven't looked back, you know, since then. It took me – the forehand groundy was a little shaky in the beginning. It was kind of flying around. And, and the more I thought about it, the more it, it just didn't get fixed. And eventually I just said, screw it. And I just stopped thinking about it. And, like, overnight, once I stopped thinking about it, it just got better. So – Look, um, I've had to sort of tinker with string bed setup. Mm -hmm. um, I used to go with a, a, an 18 gauge synthetic cut. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Break a uh, lot? Broke it a ton. And mm -hmm. it was 18 gauge at like 70 pounds because I was scared to death oh. with a 125. It would <laughs> yeah. fly all over, right? So it didn't fly all over, but I had zero feel. I mean, yeah. I try a drop shot and the thing would land on the baseline or I try a drop shot and, it, you know, it'd roll up to the net. So I finally hit on um, a poly um, main, 17 gauge poly mains um, and then a six and then still the 18 gauge for the crosses. And I can't break, I can't break those strings. I mean, so, and that's just, and I string those up at about 63 and for whatever reason that works for me, I get questions all the time. Well, what do you think's, you know, what do you think is the best racket for me to play with? And I just say, I frankly don't know. I just said, here's what I do and here's why I do it. Here's my string setup. And I say, but, you know, my recommendation, the way I do it, I haven't run into anyone else that I know that plays with a weed that does all this kind of, that they do the same thing. I know guys who play with a weed racket, same model, and they string it with gut at like 35 pounds. Mm -hmm. I couldn't play with that but they couldn't play with the way I do it. So the only way that you can really figure this thing out is to, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully get a demo and go out there and just tinker with it and, and see what works for you. And, and that's, that's the only advice I can give, but Greg Hefner, I don't know what he's asking about I me. Mean, this guy is <laughs> a great player. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> thanks a lot for the question, Greg. And I think a video for you, Brent, that would really blow up on YouTube would be winning with weed. <laughs> and you know that would be well it's, you know it's you know it's it's legal in colorado i know it's now legal yeah. in california yeah so uh oh oh you you mean the weed racket yeah I with the racket okay. but yeah, the whole okay. word play. I, i'm horrible with puns i do a lot of them that's so. a good one winning with weed good thank you thank you All right. yeah yeah, and, and so we have uh, another fellow player actually i don't know if you remember frank van lerven but uh, apparently you played against frank before and so he has a comment well a few of them we we don't have gold balls in europe so my focus is senior world championships right and he's got a path uh, similar to yours brent and then he said that he played you in umag last year do you remember playing frank uh i do remember playing frank uh, i recall i think it was the first round we played uh, a 65s tournament actually um before the team event there so umag uh, last year had the, had the world cup team event. It was in September. can't remember the dates. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to be captain of the four man USA world cup team. And, and, and one of my teammates and I went over there and, um, uh, Steve and I went over there a week early to play a 65s doubles before the team event, the seventies team event. And I think we played Frank in the first round, as I recall, um, and I, as I recall, it was a, it was a tough match. Um, and, but, uh, so what's, so what's his questions? Uh, oh, I just put the, the comment yeah, yeah. there. Yeah. I was a, uh, I don't want to get it oh, too it was, much. Into it was the... pretty contentious match as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I recall, well, look, I'm, I'm not going to get into it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have um, to do that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's but, but yeah, it's cool to hear from Frank <laughs> and the, from other people who have played, played you. Uh, Mark has a question about, uh, mixed doubles at the national level. Any particular observations on on that? 
Wags, Mark Wagner, a great tennis player from Northern California. He and I actually played some doubles back in the day when we were a lot younger. Um, he had to carry me in all of those tournaments. He was he was really one of the top guys in NorCal, and I was just starting to kind of learn how to play. You know, the mixed doubles thing is, um, you know, my wife and I have won six national husband-wife uh, gold balls, right? We've won, um, let's see, three three clay, two grass, and one hard court. And that's, that's a little different than mixed because um, it's a husband-wife deal. And for us, for us, the first couple of years, it really took us a couple of years before we kind of, before I figured out that I've got to stop wanting it so much for my wife to win mm -hmm. that I was sort of overplaying, right? I was trying to go back to what I told you I used to do, which was try to control the point, was to try to win the point rather than trust and just say, look, she's a good player. She's a 5-0 women's player. She knows what she's doing. And, and, and yet I knew that she really wanted to win badly, right? I knew she, 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 she'd never won a goal of ball before. She wanted to win one, and I wanted to win a four. So it took us a couple of years to finally figure out that um, – and this is, you know, Mark's question is mixed doubles, and I'm assuming it's at that kind of 10-0 mixed doubles level where you've got both players who are, you know, all four, I mean, all four players are a pretty equal ability. And, and so I think, I, I, I think inst instinctively the guy wants to sort of dominate. And what I found with my wife is that just the opposite works. If mm -hmm. I can actually be the steady one mm -hmm. and, you know, she's the lefty. We've got her over in the do side, returning serve. I'm on the ad side. If I can just get the ball over the cross court in front of her, she's got this lefty thing where it's just, it's mean. And she loves to go out there. She loves to poach. She loves to cross. Um, so, uh, and, and yet I've also played some mixed with um, some gals who, who don't want to do that. They want to be back in the baseline. And so for, for me, I say that's fine. If, if you're more comfortable back there in the baseline, then that's where I want you to be. I'm not going to tell you, you got to do what my wife does. Let's put you in your comfort zone. If that comfort zone is back in the baseline, then here's our strategy. You're going to do one of two things. You're either going to try to hit the ball cross court, put it in front of me, let me do something, and or you're going to lob. And, and if it's a good lob, what's going to happen is the chances are it'll be another lob coming back. And, and maybe that helps me, right? So um, I, I, I don't know if that's answering Mark's questions, but, um, you know, um, I, I just think at the national level, mixed doubles, um, it's, it's great tennis. There's some really great mixed doubles teams, and it's fun. And, and it's a Great way to learn about your game. I mean, a lot of people think, you know, a lot of players go out mixed doubles. Hey, look, one of my one of my serious learning paths to becoming a better player has been playing a lot of mixed. And I played a lot of mixed, you know, without my wife, my, um, you know, back back in the 50s, back in the 55s. And the only reason I did was they offered singles, doubles, and mixed. And they didn't have any restrictions. It said, if you want to play all three events, you can do that. And I just knew, I said, look, I looked at the men's draw and I said, Chances are I'm not going to win this tournament and singles thing. So why not maximize my time there by playing by playing in three events? Mm -hmm. So um, the more you can put yourself out there in tournament match situations or league match situations where the results are made public, right? They're posted somewhere online. A little little extra a little extra pressure on that. To me, that's where the learning really, really happens. It's one thing to play practice matches at your comfy confines of your tennis club, yeah. but you're playing the same guy most of the time. You guys know what's going on. And, and to me, there's not a lot of learning going on. That could be a great fitness opportunity. And, you know, I do that lots of times in, in, in just practice matches, you know, points over, I'll sprint to go get the ball, mm -hmm. right? Points over, I'll go, I'll sprint to get the ball. Like it. So um, Mark, I hope that answered your question. 
Yeah, no, that's great stuff. And uh, yeah, it takes a lot of a lot of hard work. I really enjoy how you're hammering home that we need to put ourselves continually in these pressure situations, because I mean, that's the only way that you're going to gradually get comfortable with those situations. And, you know, that's when your true competitive game comes out is is uh, obviously when you're competing. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, back when I started playing senior tournaments, I was just I was so tight. I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was, there was a time where I lost to a guy. I just went, Oh my God, I cannot believe I lost this guy who I thought on paper, well, not on paper, but you watch this guy play, you go, this guy can't, this guy can't break an egg. And yet, you know, he was pushing and all this stuff, but I was so nervous, so tight. And I finally figured out, I just said, look, I've got to find a way to break through the nerves. Because if I don't, I'm never really going to learn how to play the game. And so my, my philosophy or, my, or the way that I did it back then was I looked at my calendar, looked at my work schedule, and I said, I've got to shove as many tournaments into my calendar as I possibly can without even thinking about winning or losing, just so I can go out there and start to desensitize myself yeah. to the nerves, right? Because, yeah. I mean, very few people are naturally not nervous. Most people have got some, they get tight, whether it's, you know, whether it's start of the match or whether it's now, now they're serving at four, two in the second, they won the first set and they're going, man, I can taste, I, I, I can taste the finish line and, yeah. and the nerves of the tightness starts to get in there. And, and, and my only solution has been to how often can I put myself in those situations where where I just I just desensitize myself to, you know, to that feeling. Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. I love it. That's that's huge for, for all of us. Um, and yeah, you know, in doing some research about uh, gold balls, I saw that Dodo Cheney won three hundred and ninety four gold balls, which is insane. And then she won her first one, I think, at the age of fifty five. So uh, that that you know, when you mentioned that you play multiple age groups, I think uh, that's obviously what what she did. Um, but well, just just. Just do the math on that. It's insane. It's insanity. Yeah. So she's playing singles, doubles. She's playing every mix she can get into. She's playing every kind of event. Um, you know, she had the luxury of her husband was a pilot, commercial pilot. So she could fly all over the place, do this, do that. She played all the tournaments. But, um, and of course, her, her son, Brian Cheney, a guy in my age group, senior legend. I mean, this guy... Talk about a guy who who I've learned so much about about the game of tennis, um, not only in terms of stroke technique, but in terms of tactics and strategies, core positioning, mental. Um, this guy, Brian. Uh, anyway, I could we could we could do a whole thing on just him alone. Yeah, no, <laughs> for sure. And uh, you know, so one other th interesting thing that I read, and which makes sense, but I'm curious if you have come upon this, is that some players. Uh, Allegedly, they pay former pros and whatnot uh, to play with them so that they could win a gold ball, which is getting my gears turning personally. But but uh, have you ever experienced that or played against uh, some players who have done that? Sure. Oh, yeah. And it's it's, you know, whatever. It's 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 just it's <laughs> yeah. kind of a novelty to me. Right. And then you yeah. go out against those guys and, and, and the good player just never sees a tennis ball. I mean, right. So. Yeah. You know, because typically what happens is the guy who's paying the pro, yeah, right, is probably not all that great as a player. Yeah. And he's kind of hoping, well, maybe I'll buy my way in. And there have been a few guys I've known who've who who've bought their way to a gold ball, but they're good. They're they're good. They're just trying to take the next step up yeah. and find that and find that guy who who might normally not play with this guy. Um and there you go. So it happens. Yeah. I mean, Brent, why do you think I'm doing this podcast? I'm just setting up the relationship <laughs> with all these guests so that I can then, you know, <laughs> cash in. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if you're talking about, you know, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, let's get out in the court and we'll, and we'll do a little coaching thing and then we'll set a price and we'll do an interview and we'll get, we'll get Mirabon up for, up for auction. Fantastic. No, no, the other way around. Um, but uh, curious, uh, Brent, how much resistance training and mobility and stretching have you or do you do? And it, has that increased 
quite a bit over the years since, um, you know, you've started training uh, very seriously and winning gold balls and such. Yeah. Um, I was never, never, never stretched ever. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, you know, everyone tell me I've got, you know, daughters who are certified yoga instructors and they're going, dad, what's, what's the deal? How come, how come you don't even stretch? I mean, one thing would be doing yoga on a regular basis, but you don't even stretch. And so, um, over the last 10 years or so, I've gotten into a stretching routine. I'm not, I'm not super limber. I'm not super, you know, I'm not a yogi. I don't, I don't go to yoga classes. I don't do the stuff, but I do. Um, I do a 15 minute, about a 15 minute routine hmm. after either I've done some off court training or I've done some, you know, tennis. I just go home. It's super simple. And all I'm trying to do is just sort of stretch out, stretch out the legs, stretch out the hamstrings, hamstrings, most of all, um, and stretch out the lower back, um, shoulders. It's really simple, but it's really helped. It has really helped a lot. I think to, to help me when I'm, when I'm in a category one tournament, you know, a a, a ball tournament to be able to survive from, from day to day. So, you know, as you asked the question, I was thinking back to tournament, um, I think my second year in 65s in Minneapolis, the indoors. And I was just kind of shocked because I, I would play my singles and then I would go to this part of the gym. And, you know, a lot of the other guys had finished their matches and, 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 and they were all upstairs at the bar or they were all upstairs, you know, eating lunch or doing whatever. And I just thought, man, there's just nobody, no one is really doing this where it feels like to me, there's just so much benefit, even if it's, even if you're not spending an hour, which, which I couldn't do, I couldn't, you know, you know, unless there was someone who was guiding me through it. Mm-hmm. So for me, 15 minutes just works. You might need less, you might need more. I don't know. But I think there's, there's a ton of value in stretching yourself back out after you played. I don't do any stretching before. I mean, all the things I've read and heard about stretching before you really kind of warmed up, not smart. I mean, I'll do some dynamic kind of warming up before I play, but I, I don't do any stretching. So, yeah, I'm not the I'm I'm not the I'm not the guy who will tell you, oh yeah, you know, well every you know Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and one day on the weekends, um, you know, I go into my hot yoga and I do that. Look, I you know, and if and if guys do that and it works, do it. Just keep doing it. Try it. Maybe even try it. But for me, I've found that all I need is about, and would I be better if it was more than 15 minutes? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a, and look, 15 minutes is no big deal. That's not a big yeah. time, not a big time suck out of your, out of your schedule. So, so yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's huge because um, a lot of people, what they do, uh, if they figure out, okay, I, to get better, I need to work out or have a routine, what they do is they, they say, okay, 45 minutes. And then they think, oh, I can't do this, you know, but instead just setting up and a doable amount of time, uh, maybe even something like five, 10 minutes in the beginning, and then you get consistent then you can, you know, bring it up a little bit each time. So, uh, that's great to hear. And it's obviously working. Well, you just brought up the word. I mean, you just brought up the word, which is consistency. Yeah. Um, you know, you gotta, you got, you gotta build some habits. And, and for yeah. me, the stretching thing was kind of a, you know, I just got, God dang it. All right. Well, let's, let's, let's do it. Like you said, let's do it for five, seven minutes today. Yeah. And then it becomes a habit and you start to, the payoff is not immediate payoff takes time. You know, you may not feel anything for three weeks, four weeks, but then you start to realize that, you know what, I felt a little, a little better on that out wide slice backhand today. I felt a little bit more limber, a little bit more on balance. And, and that's probably because the stretching you've been doing that habit that you'd built up. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, is your preparation for singles matches any different than doubles in terms of formulating game plans or, uh, you know, pre, you know, practice routines or anything of that nature? So are you talking about like you're like you're at the tournament, you're in the tournament and um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Much. I mean, if I've got a known opponent in singles or known opponents in doubles, um, I'm, I'm going to be thinking, I'm going to be thinking about primarily what do they not want me to do? 
right? What what part of the court do they not want me to take them into? What 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 part of the court um, do they not want me in? Mm-hmm. And um, so I'll I'll be thinking strategically or tactically uh, like that. Again, it gets back to more a shot choice. Where do I want the ball to land over there? And then where do I want to move to next on the court? And part of shot choice is, well, where am I trying to move them? So we all heard this term about, well, you know, it's really great to be an all-court player where you can, you know, you could serve and volley, you could chip and charge, you could stay back, you could play groundies, you could, you could, you could really play from all parts of the court. And I think what I've sort of hit on in the last few years is, well, I want to force my opponent to be an all-court player player. I want I want to force them into different parts of the court. And if I don't if I'd never played them before, part of the first few games is kind of probing to see what parts of the court did they not like as much? What parts of the court where they go over there and they really kind of go for the winner. They really because for whatever reason. So for me it's less about looking for well, they got kind of a weak backhand, or they got they got a weak this, or they got a strong this, um, and so to me, it's really it's much more about where do I you know where do I want to put them in the court? If, if you know if it's if it's a known opponent, then I've I've got some intel already, um, and and then if it's not a known opponent, well, look, I mean, I'm I'm only smart if I go out and ask someone, hey, you know, have you played so and so, and and if that's the case, I'll get little intel. It doesn't always work out. Some of them might say, "Oh man, you got this guy." I just like, "Don't hey, don't say that." I don't. Yeah. Want, yeah. That's kind of the kiss of death, right there. Yeah, it is. But um, I'll just ask him about certain things, and and I'll keep that in my mind. But does that is that always the game plan? Not always. And lots of times, the game plan is kind of based on me executing certain things, right? And on that day, for whatever reason, I come out of the blocks. I'm not executing the thing I need to, to be able to kind of deploy certain, certain, certain tactics. So, so then it gets into, well, what, what adjustments do I have to make Mm -hmm. temporarily? Not maybe for the rest of the match, but maybe I'm, maybe if I could just do something for the next five minutes, that would be a little bit different. That would kind of get me back into executing what I need to do. Then I'll just do that. The doubles thing is, the doubles thing is, is, um, Again, it's the same thing. You go to your partner, and you know if it's it's if it. And I rarely play a category one tournament with someone I've never played with before. I mean, it's always someone I know. I've got I've got some history with, right? So, um, actually, when I when I say that, and I'm I'm looking at Frank's Frank's comment there. I played with with Steve um, in Umag, and we never played before. We never played doubles before. And, um, and so we had to kind of work it out, right? We sort of had to work some things out. We didn't know, we didn't know our opponents at all. And so I, I would say if that's the case, then you just kind of go, well, what's your, what's your comfort level? Where, what do you feel best doing? And you try that for a set. If it works great, keep going. If not going, man, you know, you think we ought to change anything? And and then Steve and I, as we went through that tournament last year, we I just got more and more confident knowing I know what he's going to do with this shot. Mm-hmm. I know how he now thinks. Yeah. And so much of that is knowing how your partner thinks and what they're about to do. Um, but in terms of strategizing, I mean, Steve and I played, I think, four matches to win the tournament. We didn't know anybody. You know, in the finals, all we knew was, oh, well, you guys are playing the number two or three guys ranked in the world, the ITF points in the world, in the 65s, and and all people just said, oh, they're really good. Great. Could you help me out a little more than just that? So um, so we just kind of navigated our way. You know, the first set was tight, and the second set, we just kind of – we just kind of got, got, got rolling. So um hope that answered your question. Yeah, beautiful. Great stuff there. Um, Jay Look has a question here. Is there a benefit to becoming a yogi versus average good flexibility? I think the more the better. I think it's I think it's personal. I think it's individual. Um I would say that if I had become if I was taking yoga classes three times a week, I'd probably be a better player. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
But that's me personally. Yeah. That's me personally. I think some players might at this point um, be better off spending. So if you're taking three classes a week, what's that? 60, 90 minutes a class? Yeah. I've never taken one, so I don't know. But let's say it's 60 minutes. Well, that's three hours. Are you better off spending some of that time on your game, on the court or off court training? I don't know. For me right now, I've sort of settled in over the decades knowing here's who I am. Here's what I know about my game. There aren't going to be any major wholesale changes to stroke technique or tactics and strategies. You know, maybe the mental thing will will get a little bit better, which it can always always do. Um, so maybe for me, stretching more would be a, be a, a real benefit. But if someone is, um, you know, someone's knocking on the door of I can win a round, I can win two rounds, but then I'm struggling in let's say the round of sixteen to to be able to advance in the you know category one, the gold ball tournament. Well, maybe you're better off breaking up that 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 once a week 60 minute yoga thing into you know four 15 minute things mm -hmm. throughout throughout the week and spending those other two hours working on your game. Yeah, beautifully put. I mean, you really have to um, self assess and figure out why am I winning? Why am I losing? What what part of the game that I work on right now will give me the biggest return on investment? Um, so you may be already flexible enough, but maybe the problem is, is your mindset or the problem is your backhand that's getting picked on every match. So, um, yeah, like Brent said, you've got to do a self-evaluation there. Uh, great question here from Rich. Or, yeah, even in your 70s, why do you love the game so much? Okay. All right. This is the great Rich Krinks from Alameda, California. Um <laughs> So I think my I think my early morning promo, Marabon, must have gotten some of my boys on the on Good. the podcast today. Um, you know, Rich, f for me, and I, you know, he, he and I are good friends, and we know each other well. Cool. Um, and we actually both come from baseball backgrounds, and mm -hmm. and so I'm just a competitive person, right? I mean, I just love that. I love that feeling, of getting out there and kind of putting it on the line, mm -hmm. and seeing what seeing what happens. And, you know, my wife, my, she loves to go out there and go, Oh honey, did, did you see the bird? Did just, well, look at that bird, beautiful bird over there. And I'm going, <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm not out there for a beautiful day. Right. I mean, if I'm yeah. practicing and this and that, I just love to compete. And I don't know. I mean, I think, I think if you love to compete, you know what that feeling is. It's just kind of, it's in your blood. I don't think you, I mean, I do know with, with me, um, I do have a hard time sustaining that thing throughout the entire year. So I mentioned Brian Chaney uh, before, uh, mm -hmm. Dodo's son, Dodo Chaney's son. Mm -hmm. This guy is a machine. I mean, this guy can go 12 months a year, 365 days and just play tournament after tournament after tournament. I can't do that. I know that about myself. I can, I can show up and kind of the tournament schedule for me the last few years has been starting in January down the desert. There's four tournaments down there working its way through a couple of nationals. And then finally by, you know, the end of June, I pro on some years I've done some traveling, um, the desert, Northern California, Baton Rouge, um, Florida, uh, uh, North Carolina, Georgia, within that, within, within a six or seven month period. And I'm, I'm just going, you know what, I'm done. I'm done. And it's, it's enough tournaments to, if I need to have some results to try to be uh, selected, try to be uh, considered for you know, the USA world cup team for that, for that year, then that's, then that's plenty of results for them to consider me. Um, and look, we're 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 here in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We love coming up here in the summer and the fall. And so for me, it's a time to kind of get off of the off of the intensity of all the training, all, the intensity of knowing that all right, in three weeks I got another I got another tournament coming up. I just played a tournament on hardcore and I got another tournament now coming up on clay. So what am I gonna do to prepare? And and all that there is some there is some stress in it, but I kind of like it. I mm -hmm. kind of like it. And so to answer Rich's question, I don't think, I mean, look, we know people who are 
a lot older than 70. I know guys in their, you know, 80s. I've seen players in their 90s. These guys are just locked in, mm. right? I mean, so I don't think we ever get rid of that, of that, of that love of competition. And, you know, a lot of it for me is I, is I love the training. I love that stuff. I, I love, you know, when I'm at Berkeley, I used to, I don't do any more, but I used to be able to Berkeley tennis club, play my tennis, go to my locker, take off my tennis shoes, put my running shoes on, jog the one mile over to Memorial stadium over Cal. And back then the th place was wide open. And this is one of the original, you know, football only stadiums, a bowl mm. and, you know, 75 rows to the top. Mm. And so I'd run the stairs over there and you'd get to the Western side of the stadium and you'd look over the East Bay, over the Bay area, over to San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge. You go, well, wow. I think I'm the only one who's doing that today. No one else is doing that. Nice. And for me, that was that was something that I needed to do to build confidence in my tennis, thinking that I'm outworking these guys. Yeah. And because I didn't have the luxury of playing a ton of junior tennis, kind of getting that foundation of junior tennis, didn't have the thing as an adult. And so um, I'm not saying that that's that that's the formula, but for me, it was. Mm -hmm. I had to build a way of getting confident with my tennis and the way was for me can I feel that I'm out working these guys every single day? Yeah. Beautiful. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just like you said, you know, sometimes if you feel like uh, your opponents have one advantage over you, then you have to shift and figure out how can I get the advantage uh, and, and, you know, go against theirs and, and win. And, and you found that the confidence well, and fit. Yeah. And, and I, and I learned early on that there was a guy, um, his name was Steve Turpin. Mm -hmm. from Sacramento, great junior player. I played him once in the juniors. He, he just kicked my butt that one summer in the 14s. And then I had to play him in the 35s, which mm -hmm. was like, what, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm nervous. I got to play this guy. And I got to go, oh my God, I remember him beating me 11, 11, the juniors. Well, here it is 20 years later. And, you know, he obviously had not been playing much and he'd put on a few pounds. Mm -hmm. And even though I was a little tight in the beginning, I finally realized this guy, this guy is not the same player. And, and the reason I could compete with him is because I'd been devoting myself to, to fitness and playing a lot and practicing. Mm -hmm. And I found that over the years that there have been some tough guys that I played, some great players who just could not hang with me if we got into the third set. Yep. Even though the strokes, you look at this guy, beautiful, everything, just cleaner and a whistle. But look, Cleaner and a whistle doesn't work if they can't get over the tennis ball. So fitness. Love it. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, Dick says conditioning needs to be done when playing two hour matches in 90 degree weather. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've looked at practice sets. Uh, now I've told this guy, Hey, it's 90 degrees today. We're playing three sets regardless. You know, if someone wins the first two, we're still playing a third. And, and again, I look at that as a fitness opportunity. Maybe I'm working on something. I, I'm, I'm not really concerned if I win the sets because there is something I want to kind of work out and kind of feel. Um, but I'll also look at this. Wow, what a, what a great day to go out there and use this as a fitness opportunity. And it may be nothing more than, all right, my whole goal for today, I'm not working on a tactic. I'm not working on a stroke. I'm not working on winning. All I'm going to do today is I'm going to hustle. I'm going to out hustle every single ball. Mm -hmm. And, and if I come away after two hours of doing that, then you know what? I know it's paid off and maybe it didn't pay off that day, but it, you know, somewhere tomorrow, somewhere down the road, right. it's going to pay off. Yeah. When it's tough conditions like that. Uh, fantastic. Uh, good. Uh, yeah. I got, I got a couple more minutes and then I yeah. got a scoot. That's right. Yeah. And Gina has a good comment about yoga, helping mindfulness. So I want to ask you, Brent, about uh, web tennis, obviously, where everybody should go and check out webtennis.com and also obviously your YouTube channel. I was curious about how you got into that and, you know, what the goal is of web tennis. Yeah. Um, good question. So back in 1998, I turned 50 and just seems like Marabon, every time there's a birthday that has a zero at the end of it, <laughs> I kind of kind of go, wow, uh, let's see, where have I been? Where am I now? And, you know, where do I want to go to? Yeah. And in 1998, um, 
you know, I was teaching a lot of tennis. I was teaching about 35, 40 hours a week. And my body was pretty beat up from, um, from all that. And I was just kind of looking for, is there another way that I can, I can get my tennis knowledge, my tennis expertise out there without having to um, be feeding balls on, on a, a tennis court and literally for the rest of my life, because making a decent living doing that, but not really getting ahead to the point where, boy, well, if I do this for another 20 years, the retirement thing will kick in. It just, it just didn't, I just didn't see that. So there was this thing in 1998 called the internet and, <laughs> and <that? laughs> yeah, it was this thing. There was very, there were very few commercial applications. Um, and there was, uh, there was one tennis website, I think it was called uh, first service or first Serve or something like that. Uh, one of my really good friends, great guy, um, Jim McLennan was mm. part of that. And uh, anyway, so, I just thought, well, maybe God, maybe there's a way this 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 internet thing I could do it. So I got my first domain in 1999, webtennis.net. I couldn't buy .com because there was some guy in South America who was cyber squatting on webtennis.com. He wasn't doing anything with it. it. Took me a couple of years to be able to buy it from him. But um, I was working at the California Tennis Club at the time, San Francisco, and so on my before I got up, had to commute in the morning my lunchtime hours. And then at night I just started tinkering. How am I going to, how am I, how am I going to make this work? And back then, you know, there was, <laughs> I mean, there was no high speed internet. There was, there was dial up. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't do video, you couldn't do audio. And the only way that you could kind of get your information out there was through text. So mm -hmm. one of the great pieces of advice I got back then as well, just write as if you're on the court teaching, mm -hmm. just, you know, what, what, what would your voice be? So that at least you're trying to get your unique voice out there. So over the course from 1999, got the domain, figured out how to build a crappy little website. I mean, it was terrible, <laughs> just horrible. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you build a email list that you can kind of automate where you don't have to manually put in uh, names and email address uh, addresses. And then eventually got a merchant account, started, you know, making some, again, some crappy little courses and got them out there. And, Six years later in 2005, I just said, look, if I can do this thing full time, um, I think I can make a go of it. So kind of took a risk, told the guys at the Cal Club, San Francisco, love you guys, but you know what? I'm out of here in October. Yeah. And so I retired from the club thing in October 2005. It took me a couple of years to spend full time going after it, but I eventually replaced my income from being a uh, tennis director and head pro at the Cal Club. And that's allowed me ever since then to really do what I want to do, which has been to train, to play. If I get an internet connection, I can do my business. Um, so my focus has been over all those years is building courses, helping players with strokes, with technique, um, uh, tactic strategies, the mental stuff, fitness. And then recently, the last few months, I've really gotten into a company called Perium that has, you know, for, for me, I've always believed in supplements in terms of no matter how well we eat, I still think we need help. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm building a residual, uh, a residual income program with Purim and, and help a lot of people in terms of the one thing that's really helped me do is get off of ibuprofen. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about all the training daily tennis, daily off court stuff. I mean, I was having to suck down two or three ibuprofen almost every day. Oof. And I think we all know, no, that's just not great. So um, I've gotten some help. I've been off of ibuprofen now for about three months uh, uh, because of Perium and helping people lose weight, helping people in other areas of their health and fitness. And right now with COVID going on, I mean, what's top of mind? I mean, top of mind's immune boost. I mean, who, who's not thinking, what can I do to protect myself? So, so um, yeah, I mean, if you want some more stuff, you know, some more information about what I'm doing, just go to webtennis.com. Um, and I'll give you a free course about how to help you with your top spin second serve. Uh, the other thing is, like you said, go over to my YouTube channel, just go over to YouTube, search web tennis and you'll find me. And, um, yeah, you can, if you want to shoot me an email, Brent at web I'm on Facebook as well, uh, over at web tennis. Love it. Yeah. I was going to suggest everybody, cause we still have some other questions and we really appreciate it, but Brent has got a run a busy guy and uh so feel free to email brent as i'm sure he'll be okay with uh before i let you go brent uh 
classic question I always ask, what is one key, t- key tip that you can uh, tell us to help us improve our tennis games? One key tip. Um, well, I, 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 I think the thing would be, and I, and I, and I really don't talk much about stroke technique with players because I want them focusing more on core positioning and shot and shot uh, choice. But the one thing that I got early on from Tom Stowe was the guy who helped me back in the eighties in terms of coaching me is he said, look, my job is to pair away, take away all the extra stuff that you do with stroke technique that you just don't need. And so I would ask players to kind of take a look at themselves videos of the, the best way to do it is what are you doing stroke technique that is absolutely not needed because the more stuff you add stroke technique wise, um, the less consistent you're going to be as a shot maker. Um, and look, I'll, I'll make this offer. If you guys want to take a short little video on one of your strokes, you can send it to me. Uh, you know, I won't charge you for it. I'll take a look and I'll do what Tom Stowe did for me. I'll start taking parts away and say, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't need that part. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you, Brent. It was a pleasure and I'm sure we'll be talking again soon and, uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, everybody and Brent, and, uh, we'll see you all again very soon. Thanks, Mayor Bond. A lot of fun. Appreciate Thanks, it. Brent. You too. Bye. See ya. Thanks, Brent.